I'm doing is to provide you a model, but the goal of it is it's a model. Don't focus so much on the model, but focus on the work. Everybody get that? So this model is the PDSA model developed by Deming. It was not designed for health. And I don't care if you want to do plan, do, study, act, plan, do, check, act, whatever. It's about taking the actions and taking it in a strategic, thoughtful manner to go, as my friend said, to make data-driven decisions. And to recognize that you, you, there's things you, I'll, we'll talk about that you can get caught up in. So PDSA is a philosophy, and it really is. It's about taking small changes. You know, the, you can take a small change and make a huge result. I did work with a health center. I want you to know they, they used to laugh and tell me you needed a PhD to be able to, to schedule an appointment. 22, no, I'm exaggerating. Lots of different appointment types, only certain ones at certain times of the day, no more than this, no more than that. Does that sound familiar? And then, you know, we have to make sure we get out on time so we don't schedule anybody after 2 o'clock. And as my friends in DeKalb did, I said, well, what do you do about teens? What time do they get out of school? Well, they get out of school at 3. Well, how can they get here if your last appointment's at 2.45? may have been three. They said, well, we give them an excuse absence. I'm like, now how, if they don't want their mothers to know that they're coming, are they going to explain an excused absence on their card? Is that what I said? It's been one of my favorites. Or, oh my God, we want working women to come. Oh my God, you can't get an appointment from 11.30 to 1.30. Mm. So it's about little changes. And why I say that is, I went to work with a health agency Public Health Department in Livingston County, and I'm allowed to use their name, they've given me permission. And they, are, their numbers were going down, and efficiency, they were going to not have to change staffing. And we had them track data of how many they were seeing over time. And they redesigned their appointment schedule, a little change. They, they, went, they had 14 appointments a day, 14 appointments a day. That's two per hour in, a seven hour, in an eight hour day. They were to schedule 14. Oh, this was a place that, I'm telling they had a 1% no show rate. I was like in shock. They, they presented it, and I wish my friend from the retired woman, they presented it to the staff, and an appointment was an appointment, it was an appointment. They scheduled two per hour. But they all agreed on how that would look. They also changed the days that they, they had three different sites. And they saw that they really decided that they used to think going to the college was Friday was the right thing. But no, what day? Thursday, because they were getting ready. They went, they, sorry, that's how. Well, in one, and they tracked, first of all, they tracked two things. Did they schedule 14? And for them to be fiscally sustainable, they had to have seven Medicaid because they had a, a waiver program. They had to schedule, see seven patients on Medicaid. They tracked it. In one year, they increased their visits. They tracked it. They did the change of the appointment schedule. They changed the days. That's it. Okay? That's all they did. But they tracked it. They knew every day. If they weren't making 14, they tried to figure out what was going on. If they saw certain things, they did one other little thing, which was they noticed that Tuesdays had a higher no-show rate. They told me this later. They never told me any of this when we did the evaluation. Saw them, they, they started scheduling like Tuesdays and Thursdays at the college, 15, because they weren't making 14, so they figured they'd go 15. They increased their total visits by 37% in one year. The next year they increased 10, and then they went down and they had to tweak it but they also became sustainable, which allowed them to increase staff and do a better job. A li that's not a big change, but what they did was they made the, you think, oh my God, this is a major thing. So it's about 
little things and to do little things one step at a time. So this is the model for improvement. And we ask three questions. And we're going to go over them. But it's associated with this plan, do, study, act. This is how we present it. I love this. So the first question is, what are we trying to accomplish? What do we want to achieve? Right? Then how do we know that the change is an improvement? So what do we want to accomplish? What's our goal? What's our aim? How do we know? What do we think we're going to do? How do we know? Because not all changes are improvements. And then what change can we make that will result in? So you always know, you want to look at what is our goal? How do we know if it's better? Well, that means whatever, we're achieving our goal. And then how do we design a change so that we can get an improvement? Because you design a change and it may not result in an improvement. And it happens. You, you know what? Nobody's perfect. You start saying you're not going to eat lunch, out. That's designed to be the improvement. Well, you start, you start, you start bringing lunch, okay, that's not an improvement. Well, what else can we do? Well, maybe what I can do is on those days that I bring lunch, I still have to put $10 in the envelope. This is an overview. We're going to go through each of these. I love big pictures. So we're going to go over the plan, the do, the study, and act. But I'm putting this up there because if you want to go talk to your staff, this is a great overview. But before we start, for me, you can't do this by yourself. And you need a team. Okay? And you, this is somebody else's slide that I work with. That's why I'm doing it. You need a team. And you need to build a team. It could be, you know, in a small health center, it could be all everybody. In a larger, you want to make sure you represent everyone in the composition. You have your front desk, your back office, your technical. More importantly, you, if you're committed to this, you have to give it the time. You must give the team the time to meet. And you can't throw it in as part of staff meetings. I'm working with a bunch of health centers uh, in upstate to increase the number of uh, adolescents and they have a team and I'm like if there's no team meetings it doesn't matter you can't do it without and it doesn't have to be long oh trust me do not ever schedule me for a meeting over an hour you might as well know you're in big old trouble oh two you have to have an agenda you have to have a reason for the meeting now you can have scheduled meetings and say just report in and everybody has to have a responsibility and you have to report. So if you're working in a big organization and you've got a, how many of you have CQI teams? Or how many of you have project teams? Report, share, information. I worked with these five managers, five or six. And let me tell you, they track data. In the beginning, they called it Sue's data. And I kept saying, it's not my data. I present the data and then we talk about it. This was a monthly meeting. Some months, I would go with the person I was working with, and I'm like, I don't know what we're going to do today. I really, know, I just sort of let where the data go and what they went. But I had an agenda. My agenda for them was to become a data-driven decision-making organization. And we tracked the same, every month, number of appointments scheduled, number of appointments seen, no show rate. Number, and then, then they, it's a WIC program. Then they wanted to know not just the number of visits, but the number of participants. They did a, a tracking. Every month, we did it. And let me just tell you, it was still Sue's data. And I, I said to them, I said, oh, no, no, no. And we practiced how to report and how to do everything. And then they'd come back and report what happened when they met with staff. But we had an agenda for those meetings every month. And there was data that I presented every month. So when you have a team and you're working, remember, PDSA, quality improvement, CQI, is about data. So not only did, so I met with them and then the staff met with them. Okay, so now we're starting. You, when you start, you probably, in a larger organization, have some goals and some things you know what you want to work on. 
Whether, so, uh, for example, increasing the number of adolescents, reducing the, the uh, wait time because patients are complaining, assuring everyone gets a, um, as a teen, a sexual health assessment. Uh, for, uh, give me some examples. So there's something that you're working on. You do not do CQI on, I just want to make our health center better. There are performance indicators. Who wanted the question about indicators? Okay. So in a per, an indicator is the same thing as an, something that you're, you measure. You, the indicator is your way to the measure a specific outcome. So for example, what, what kind of work do you do? Give me what you think is an indicator. I'm going to say another. How many? Yes, so the indicator would be the number of patients with suppressed viral loads below was zero, is it? I can't remember what it's called. It. Or the percent of patients. So I, I hear a lot because I work a lot in HIV. I, you can't work in New York for 20 years and not have done some work with HIV. And one of the things is, is, is medication adherence. And I've worked with managed care which is looking at the refill. That's how they look at medication adherence. So the indicator would be refill, there is an indicator. But what's key about an indicator is there's a definition, right? Every measure you have, have a definition. So when you begin this planning, you want, that's the overall goal. You want to begin with, you can't just do a PDSA for everything. You need a specific project. So everyone wants to think. So yours may be reduce viral load to, or everyone gets a diabetic check. I know that's another big thing. And you want it to be a TB skin test. A TB skin test. What are you trying to accomplish? When does this occur? How much? So when you have a name, want to reduce increased TB tests by 4%, right? Or what I like better that your goals and your aims is not to increase, that the percentage of patients at this health center have a T, what, 75%, 80%, 90%, what's the percentage? 75% of all patients with HIV at Health Center X will receive a TB, tie, TB whatever at each visit. Right? Yearly. Yearly. We'll get a TB tie test yearly. So then you're going to plan around how you're going to do that. Got it? You need to make sure that it meets the data, which is every patient gets one once a year, and the organization, which is a TB time test. I'm big on numbers. If you're using data, if you're planning data, first of all, do not make the, people will spend years and months creating a name and not do anything else. It's just what you want to do. I'm writing all this and I'm like, 100% of all patients who come to the health center between the ages of blah, 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 will be offered a HIV test, okay? Uh, 95% of all women with a negative pregnancy test will be offered contraception on the same day. Not difficult things. Keep, you know, uh, a goal. Reduce our, our no-show rate will be below 40%. Okay? A, a, average to see each uh, nurse clinician, uh, the goal is to see 18 patients per day. Do you see? Simple. But, this, you know, you want to make sure you, everybody gets buy-in. And one of the things about that WIC program is people will focus on the number of appointments. And if you create an aim is to see 18 visits a day, that's different from what you're scheduling and how you're scheduling. As leaders in the aim, your job is to focus on what the goal of the aim is. 18 visits per day. They wanted me to say so many visits, 15-minute visits, so many, and I know. The goal is 18 visits per day. 
How we do that is we have some visits that are 15 minutes and some visits that are 30. But you don't want them focusing on the 15 minutes. That's what I'm saying about organizational needs. Does that make sense? And then you, you have to understand the aim, you can get caught up with it. I hate this part. I, I, but you need, you listen, as somebody once said to me, you got to know which way the horse is going so you can get there. And you want to ride it in that direction. But you have to figure out what direction it is. It can be any direction that you want, but you need to have a direction. And that's all the aim is. Questions. It's a goal. It's like, where do you want to go? In your own personal life, I want to take a vacation. I want to take a cruise uh, to the Caribbean in June of 1990. Um, did you see what year? <laughs> I would like to take a cruise in April 2017. That's a goal. That's not an aim. My aim is I will have $2,500 saved to go on a cruise in April 2017. Do you see the difference? Here's the examples. You see, I really do. We will, give, we will improve the number of hearing tests given by the health department. Do you see the difference? Does that really help it make it clear? So in the first one, we're just saying, well, improve the number. In the second one, we're saying the time frame, what percentage, who. It sort of tells you the who, what, where, when, and how. All right? I, smart is one. Specific, measurable, achievable, reliable, and time. That tells you timely, achievable. We don't know if 90% is. You don't know where you're starting from. You've got, I think of the who. Who? Children's in school. What? Uh, hearing test. Where? Yeah, it's very specific. I tried to give one not something. OK? So that's the aim. So that tells you, well, now you have to figure out how do we do it. So the next thing is describe the process. What is a process? I'm telling you, people, I, I think it's a word I use all the time. What's a process? Well, it takes you from A to B. <laughs> it's, it's a series of actions in a specific order to get you somewhere. You do a certain types of actions, you, you, and each action builds on the next ones to achieve your outcome. So for example, what's a, a good process when you think about it? When you go to the bank. Now, I don't know how many of you go to the bank to deposit a check, but I go to the bank to deposit a check. My first action is, is I drive my car and park in the parking lot. I walk to the bank. I fill out my bank state, my deposit slip. I endorse my check. I walk over to the teller, pray that there's no line. She takes it. Now, when I go, they write it up. I, so, okay, she takes it. I don't get a deposit slip back. I go to look at my phone to check to make sure that, the, that it's been recorded. Do you see? Each step in a process adds value. Why do we do processes? Well, it gives you a chance to look at what's going on. Because I love it when you, the, how many of you have been to a training when I did process mapping? Come on, Monroeville, right? You want to physically look at the process. You want to break it down into a step-by-step. -step. Anything you do can be broken down into a process. Here comes the industrial engineer in me. Everything has, is a step-by-step. -step. Think about what's the process of you checking into the hotel? What's the process for the staff when you check in? So how you define the process Look at what a patient visit is to a health center. That's a process, step by step. Depending on what actions are taken, you take different steps. You have to understand what goes on, what the process is, to be able to make an improvement. So if you're looking to improve blood pressure, and I, so if I hear that one with 
their process is, the process is, how do I identify somebody with 140, and what are the actions to take, and what are the treatments? You have to improve the process, the, stru the activities. Processes are just activities. Does that make sense to everybody? I'm making it more complicated than it is. So what types of processes? Well, we may look at it from a patient flow. How many of you do patient flow cycle time? What are the steps when they come? What's an information flow? I once did a medical records. We used to do these patient flow analyses, and I did it with the medical record. I wanted them to track the medical record versus the patient to understand the information flow. Material, very big in surgicals to, in surgery to do material flow and hospitals. And then clinical practice. You know, many of these evidence-based practices have processes that you have to go through. Different steps to achieve the outcome. I always like that one. So think about it. You have a standard. You have a measure, right? Performance standard. Performance standard is certain behaviors to achieve results. Your processes are the behaviors. Now, how you determine the behaviors are depending. If you're using an evidence-based practice, there are certain behaviors that you have to do. If you're running something in a health center, there are actions that happen. So when I think about it, if I'm doing um, a pregnancy test, right? And what my action is, is I want 85% of all negative pregnancy tests will receive, will be offered contraceptives on the same day. Does that make sense? So they come in, they get a negative, they can leave with oral, they can leave with an implant, they can do whatever. So there's a process of patient comes in, they have a pregnancy test, which is usually, and then who's going to offer it? How are they going to explain it? Then what is the workflow associated with getting them contraceptives? Workflow, process, they're all the same. When you're looking at um, viral suppression, there are multiple processes you have to do. When you're looking at your, so everything may, nothing just has one process. I'm a big believer in doing workflow and, workflow and flow charts. Physically seeing it. This is a picture. It identifies the process. It helps you see where it goes. Now, I will tell you that doing that, if you look at, say you want to decrease wait time, and you, I'm going to show you what a process is. Okay? This is the workflow for when a patient comes to my health center. I come in, I sign my name, I sit down. Somebody call Susan. My name's called, I go get my paperwork. I sit down. I fill out my paperwork. I wait. And then my name's called, I give them my paperwork. They ask me for a couple of questions, and then I sit down. I'm being exaggerated, right? Then I wait, and somebody brings me back to a room, and I sit, and I sit in that room. They take my blood pressure, they do everything. And then um, there's two options. If there's a, a provider room, I'll go to the provider room. If not, I'll go back to the waiting room and wait. Yes, I know, I've been to your clinics. I've been there. No, done that. Or there's a separate. Then I wait. Then I get called by the nurse. I go, she meets, da, 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 da. If there's the clinician room, I go to the clinician room. If not, where do I go? That's the process. Then what you want to begin to think about is you then study that process to do what? Identify potential sources of problems. Right? Now, when we do appointment scheduling, there's process, patient calls. They offer, so you can do a workflow with anything. I don't really show it, but there's certain nomenclature, but you can just take a piece of paper and can you see that over there patient arrives now I like to write that one's nice sign in then go to wait room they wait and then the next thing that happens is, is they go 
get paper. And they go back to the waiting room. Then they get called, check in. You see, you begin to see that when you draw it on paper. That was a quick and dirty three minute section. For me, this is a way for you to identify what's going on and what has you may not get the results that you want. Okay? So you want to really understand the process because if you understand what happens, it helps you determine how to create an improvement. Now, not only do you have to do that, you have to collect data. Now this is where we all get stopped. We do. So I'm going to talk about one of my favorite things, data. And I will tell you, I've heard every excuse about data. So why do we use data? One of my favorite things I say is data has no feelings. Data has no emotions. What? It's just the facts, Jack. You have to know where you are to know where you want to go. I don't know about you, but don't you know when you put it in your GPS, it says what's your location? So that it can help you know where to go? Uh, I don't know about you, but um, if I'm trying to figure out to save money, what do I have to look at? How much money I have. And my other favorite one is how many of you tried, to, and I'm not saying any of us here want to, how many times have, how, blah, blah. have you ever tried to lose weight without having a scale in your house? Yes, yes it's the tight jeans, right? <laughs> but that's a way to measure. Do you see what I'm saying? Data can look different. You are, having data allows you to compare to your standard, but my favorite one, it separates what you think is happening from what's really happening. That's when I call the anecdotal rule. We all think we know what's happening. How many times have you looked at the data and went, oh my God, that's not exact. I love when I get on the scale and I say, oh, I thought I was really fat today. Oh no, or the other way around. But it's really important that you get recognized that data is really helpful. It helps you decide what you want to learn. It, you have to define how it's going to be collected. You've got to operationalize it. If you're collecting data, everybody has to be on the same ballpark. So when I've done data tracking and appointments where I've made them track how many are scheduled, we define each element so that everybody knows and was doing the exact same thing and even then they don't do the same thing. So it's printing it out. Everybody knows. That's why you have indicators and you define what it means because you have to collect the data to be able to get to the indicator. The indicator tells you where the dot is because not always is it a clean measure. Like no-show rate is an indicator. And you have to have some way to collect it. So my favorite thing is when you, wait, and I'm talking data in general. This is not just for CQI. No matter what data you collect, it, no data is perfect. No data is. You know what the limitations and the, the limits are. But you want, what's going to happen most of the time is you're going to want more data because you'll, it may be, there are times when you, you need to drill down, like you'll see a trend and you want more data to help you understand that trend. That's different from saying, I don't have enough. I can't make a decision based on this. I can't decide something. We tend to want more data. And you want to, you're making it for decision makings. I always joke, it's, um, I was in a health center in Florida and they had one scale, a doctor's scale, and everybody had to get weighed. And I went, let me ask you, why can't you use just, you know, these days the, there's nice scales, they're pretty accurate. Oh, it's not accurate enough. And I went, what do you use this for? Is it kidney dialysis to see how much weight they lost? And they're like, oh, you know what? If it's one or two pounds, it's not going to make a difference. And I'm like, and how many times do women not want to get on that scale? Because I'm not, and I decline, or I tell you my weight. And then they're like, well, how do we make sure the, rooms are, the room scales are accurate? I went, well, one person who's, will get on the doctor's scale, get the weight, and then they'll go to every scale and make sure they weigh the same. But the resistance to getting 
perfect data and only a doctor's scale will do it. But it didn't matter that it was holding up and creating a huge wait time because there was one and every patient had to go. It just, so you have to weigh, you know, does collecting, is it worth whatever is happening to collect the data? Now, you want data systems that make it easy to collect the data also. That it's part of the day-to-day -day operations. And that you keep it simple. So you integrate it into your operation. So if you're tracking appointment scheduled, somebody's there in the health center, there's a report, they track it, they put it on the spreadsheet. I'm sorry, I know, you know we think we get all this data from our from Falcon, but it doesn't put it, do you remember when I was there? I was at Aniston and they gave me all these reports. Well, it didn't help to understand what was going on. The way, do you remember when I looked at the appointment? I was like, I was crying almost because I couldn't figure, gosh darn it out. Why they had such, they, we did a cycle time analysis. Does everybody know what that is? How long they spend in the health center. And there was these wait times and I couldn't figure it out. Do you remember that? I'm like, why are they not seeing enough people? Well, they gave me a pile of stuff. I went home because I was on a two day visit. I started to look at how appointments were scheduled by time of day and to look at the blocks because they had times that were blocked out and they had like four or five people coming in at the same time and that's when I realized they had a scheduling issue because you could see that there were no appointments scheduled from 11 to 1 o'clock. I don't remember if that was it or not. I can't. That was over there. My friend from DeKalb. I mean, no. So my point is, is you have to then, you then design a way that you track it. I'm working with um, family planning programs up in, and they're tracking it for a month because they, and, and they're now doing it every month because it's become part of their process. It's very easy for them to do, but they, they, the way it come, everybody thinks that the way the data comes out from the EHR, the patient management system, isn't always necessary to help you figure out what, what you need to be able to make a decision. Because if you think about it, data is just data, right? I'll make it black, so, well data leads to, as I say, information, right, because it, you can see trends. Well what gives you knowledge is when you interpret that information, you have knowledge. Data in and of itself is not knowledge. So you, ha you get on a, you, you know, you get weighed. The data is 165 pounds. The information that gives you is the weight is, a you know, and it tells you where, and the information is you have to compare it to a trend. I was 164 yesterday. The knowledge is, is that I'm okay with, with my weight loss program. Does that make sense? Data in and of itself is not useful. It's when you compare it and use it to look for trends, identify problems against baseline, against standards. That's when you get the information and the knowledge. Where's my, you're an epidemiologist? So as, as an epidemiologist, you're looking at data all the time. But unless you compare it to what happened before, like when I was in graduate school, we started to look at the rate of AIDS. That uh, tells you how old I am. And unless you really have a comparison, data doesn't do any itself. You know, data within itself is not very useful. It's with understanding what your goal is, where you were, and you always want to find data that's good enough.